okay so welcome back uh, today i would be talking on this uh, uh, microsystems fabrication by advanced manufacturing processes and the section that i would be dealing today is what is silicon and how do you process uh, silicon using advanced uh, manufacturing techniques so let's look at some of these uh, amenable materials uh, so review of the review of the previous uh, uh, lecture okay briefly so uh, in the previous lecture we really uh, try to uh, get a historical perspective of machining and uh, this was followed by the description of some of the conventional and non traditional uh, domains of manufacturing wherein uh, you know the machining uh, processes or metal cutting processes uh, machining processes were classified as metal cutting uh, processes or mechanical abrasion processes on one hand and the non traditional or the non conventional machining processes were classified on the basis of material removal mechanisms based on either mechanical removal thermal uh, removal or chemical electrochemical removal on another hand and we also saw that uh, the course's basic intention is a synergism between the microsystems uh, technology and the way to fabricate it and the advanced manufacturing processes and the integration between the two so let us uh, now see of some of the materials which are very amenable to the use uh, you know in developing in to their use of developing microsystems so silicon of course is uh, one of the principal materials which are used for microsystem fabrication because as i mentioned earlier that uh, the the traditional processes uh, really are the uh, sorry the non traditional processes on silicon are nothing but borrowed from the microelectronic industry and therefore being a microelectronic material uh, the fallout processes which really comprise of mems processes are amenable to fabrication of silicon then of course quartz and glass because uh, in most of the cases of microsystems you sometimes need optical transparency and therefore glasses and quartz are the next line of materials uh, amenable to the the uh, you know or can be classified as mems uh, materials or microsystems materials then another whole lot of class of uh, materials which are nowadays increasingly used for microsystems fabrication are polymers and then polymers uh, particularly this uh, pdms or polydimethyl siloxane which is considered to be a very very bio friendly uh, material is most used particularly in biomedical mems or biomedical micro devices and then of course pmma polymethyl methacrylate which is also an e beam resist and it is used uh, increasingly for uh, e beam lithography and other applications then this uh, material of teflon okay where uh, teflon is actually a a uh, commercial name of a material available from dupont and this teflon is a very very hydrophobic and it has excellent applications again in the biological world and so therefore teflon is another very amenable material mems material which is used mostly for fabrication of microsystems and then of course uh, there is this whole new domain of uh, microsystems which is using biological entities like cells proteins uh, Uh, or dna and these are also some of the very very frontier research areas in the biomems as to how to micro manipulate or nano manipulate sometimes the biological entities for fabrication or advanced manufacturing of mems at this particular scale so let's begin with the uh, <coughs> silicon so uh, silicon of course is the most popular mems material obtained uh, so far and uh, silicon and its compounds a variety of compounds like oxides nitrides polysilicon etc uh, can be very amenably used for microsystems fabrication and not only that um, you can categorize uh, uh, these whole class of materials based on the amount of uh, uh, you know their range of order into crystalline polycrystalline or amorphous Uh, materials where the the uh, definition of these terms are uh, kind of parallel to whatever uh, you know conventional definitions are so single crystalline means that there is one uh, particular kind of crystal with the un- repetition of unit cells 
and there is no break of this crystal whatsoever polycrystalline is that the crystal growth takes place at several centers and uh, it formulates into grains of different crystals with grain boundaries in between and amorphous is where the the range of order is rather longer where the shorter where there is no uh, orderliness at all and it is very randomly deposited um, and so these class of silicon oxide nitride and silicon as such or polysilicon can be categorized into these various uh, forms and domains so <coughs> material like silicon dioxide for example are amorphous which means that they do not possess any long range order okay so that's what uh, is basically uh, the categorization of silicon and let us look or delve into a little bit of crystallography and uh, crystal structures when we talk about especially single crystalline silicon crystals are described by their their most basic structural element the unit cells as most of us know and uh, it's a regular array of such uh, units repeated in three dimensions in a very regular manner which comprises of a crystal and the unit cell of interest have let's say cubic symmetry and each edge of this unit cell has the same length so you can divide these into different classes of crystals like simple cubic where you can see there are about eight atoms on the eight corners of this particular cube body centered cubic where you have atoms on the corners as well as one in the center of uh, the whole cubic lattice and this is what one unit cell would comprise of or look like and a repetition of all these unit cells in the three dimensions would typically result in what you call a single crystal line material and then you have face centered where these uh, faces also has some atoms apart from the corners uh, and there is no um, atom in the center of this particular unit cell so these are some of the classifications of how cubic crystals can be divided as and uh, just to reiterate or just to uh, you know uh, memorize some of the uh, fundamentals which you probably may have obtained earlier these uh, the, the crystals are really represented by directions and um, they are identified uh, using a cartesian coordinate system and the square bracket here as you are seeing is indicative of the direction in which uh, so uh, the the crystal would grow you know so it is the uh, direction of growth of the particular crystal so if i say that it is a 100 um, uh, growth that means it is growing the crystal is growing in the x direction okay if it is a 010 it is growing in the y direction similarly if it is a 001 it is growing in the z direction and not only that if uh, you know you can change the planes if their <coughs> growth is along a certain plane then it can be a 110 and uh, or it can be let's say a, you know a 101 or a 011 which corresponds to different planes of of the growth and then there can be a very interesting growth along the 111 direction which means that it is something like a triangle here as you can see uh, so the 111 direction typically is perpendicular to this particular triangle so the direction of growth is perpendicular to this particular direction so whatever it is the directions are represented by these uh, square brackets and it is a sort of sign convention to do that and uh, uh, you know if you want to represent the plane a particular plane that is perpendicular to the vector uh, square bracket xyz you represent that by this round bracket xyz which comprises of the plane of which xyz was a direction of okay so this is the plane round bracket and this is the direction square bracket and then of course a set of such planes are represented by these third bracket and the set of planes would be meaning all uh, planes of type round bracket xyz represented by the third bracket xyz so that is a sort of nomenclature which you use uh, for for uh, you know systems or uh, for identifying silicon as such so let us now <coughs> look into a little bit uh, different aspect of how you can actually make a uh, single crystalline silicon and uh, in context of that the most important method that is illustrated in literature very often is the zokralki's uh, growth method in which silicon can be obtained from polycrystalline uh, uh, silicon uh, uh, and uh, 99.99% pure polycrystalline silicon which is fused 
and this fuse uh, this fusion process is by thermal means uh, there is a crucible which is indicated here in this figure which comprises of a central cavity and this cavity as i am illustrating by this border here contains uh, the silica material the silicon material the polycrystalline silicon fused uh, material and uh, uh, this uh, this crucible so called uh, is is basically capable of rotation so you can rotate the whole crucible and also um, <coughs> it is uh, inertly filled so the temp chamber here is evacuated using pumping mechanisms as illustrated here and here and then you can fill uh, the the whole environment or atmosphere of this uh, fused uh, uh, silicon container with argon or an inert gas so that it ensures uh, the non inclusion of uh, material like oxygen or nitrogen uh, into the silicon lattice so it's extremely pure process and there are certain foundries in the world like uh, one example is memc which is uh, based in st louis at uh, missouri which actually manufactures some of these uh, silicon uh, wafers high purity single crystalline silicon wafers so the way the processing goes is that when this crucible is rotated and then uh, there is something called a seed crystal which has been obtained from an earlier process and the seed can be probably a very small a uh, crystal of a certain direction or grown in a certain direction let's say the 100 direction okay so this seed has been grown from an earlier process it is a pure crystal and the seed is inserted into this melt somewhere here as can be illustrated and uh, as is illustrated here and so therefore <coughs> the the rotation the relative rotation between the seed and the crucible and uh, you know can be varied by varying the the relative rpm and uh, what is important here is that as the seed goes and dips into the material and the seed is slowly pulled out it tries to drag along with it a part of the silicon melt and the moment the silicon melt comes out into the open atmosphere it is no longer you know a part of the crucible and therefore it can as well solidify so only advantage here is that the solidification the rates of this pulling uh, can be balanced with the rate at which uh, the relative rotation happens between the crucible and the seed and many other parameters are in a control manner so the rate at which uh, the uh, the 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 solidification um, front sort of cools off uh, you know you can really tailor it or fine tailor it in a manner so that the growth takes place in the same direction as the direction of the seed crystal okay so this is the zockerel keys crucible process so the seed is the uh, mother crystal which would eventually result in formulation of a bowl of material as can be indicated uh, by this outline that i am drawing here okay and this all uh, material in this bowl is grown in the direction of the seed crystal and the parent direction is kind of grown into this particular bowl so once this bowl is extracted you can actually cut this uh, bowl into pieces and you can fine polish uh, them and there are a lot of methodologies like uh, cnc wire cut edm or some other uh, instruments which are used for fine sizing or maybe even band saw which are used for fine sizing these wafers typically these wafers can vary between 400 microns thickness to about 900 microns thickness so some other uh, nitty gritty of this process is that uh, the chamber is uh, actually filled with uh, uh, you know it's back filled with inert gas and the crucible is uh, heated up till 1500 degrees celsius okay and uh, the seed crystal is really small chemically etched crystal and lowered into the contact with the melt so that the melt can grow in that direction Uh, it has to be carefully oriented uh, because uh, this sort of serves as a template for growth of the much larger crystals later on okay so that's how <laughs> the zokralkis uh, growth method or growth process is actually executed now uh, let us do some mathematical modeling for this process uh, which can give us an idea of how uh, you know the the liquid to solid conversion can take place in terms of latent heat of solidification 
okay, and we can just do a simple one dimensional heat flow analogy to understand the situation. So, let us say you have a crucible here in this uh, particular example and we are considering this particular zone here as you can see which is also called the zone of fusion. Okay. A zone of fusion because uh, you sort of uh, you know uh, this is the zone where the there is a uh, presence of both the states the liquid state which is into the uh, the crucible and then the solid state which is a part of the seed which is getting withdrawn and so it is a sort of semi solid semi liquid kind of zone that we are considering. So, if we apply the, the Fourier's uh, law of uh, heat uh, conduction. So, q dot x or uh, the rate of uh, flow of heat as a function of x okay, or in the direction of x is uh, really proportional to the interfacial area across which the heat is flowing. So, the interfacial area in this case can be thought of as going into the plane of this slide. Okay. So, this is the area across which the heat uh, is flowing. So, this is also known as the heat phase okay. and then <coughs> it is also proportional to the, the temperature gradient which exists in the material in the direction of flow of heat. So, in this case for example, if the temperature here is T uh, 1, the temperature here is T 2. So, temperature here is uh, T 1, temperature here is T 2 and of course, uh, uh, in this particular case T 2 is more than T 1 uh, which enables the heat to flow from the direction of T 2 to T 1. Okay. So, let us say in this particular zone of fusion that <coughs> is in question we have uh, a temperature T 1 which is actually higher than T 2 in this particular case which is that of the liquid uh, part of the zone of fusion. right? So, uh, the temperature of the liquid part is T 1 and the temperature of the solid part of uh, the withdrawn seed uh, and the bowel formulated on the seed as a template is basically T 2 okay, as illustrated here and T 1 of course, is greater than T 2 which enables the direction of heat flow in the positive y direction as you can see here. Okay. So, the heat flows from T 1 towards T 2 and uh, we need to just investigate how the rate of heat flow here into uh, the zone of fusion from the liquid side and the rate of flow out of the zone of fusion to the solid side would be balanced with each other and this heat loss which is happening. Uh, you know is is also a cause of uh, the formation of the solid uh, which means that you know in a solid state as you know the bond energy is uh, always higher and therefore there is a heat of formation of the solid which is lost you know it's called the latent heat of formation of the solid so the the difference between the uh, the rate of heat flow into the zone of fusion and out of the zone of fusion is really uh, the the quantity of heat which is lost in formulating the solid from the liquid state. So, if we model it in that manner, let us say for example, if we assume completely one dimensional heat flow in this particular case, uh, we can write the heat equation as minus k L A d T by d x in the liquid side. The minus shows that the heat is always from the higher the, the you know the uh, towards the lower temperature from the higher temperature side which is also defined by the law of thermodynamics. So, K L is uh, the conductivity the thermal conductivity of the liquid melt A is of course, the interfacial area of the zone of fusion and d T by d x is uh, the temperature gradient available across that interface between the liquid onto the crucible and the zone of fusion. And, uh, of course, uh, this heat goes into the zone and the heat which is lost from the zone of fusion into the solid can be defined as minus of minus k a where <coughs> k s sorry where k s is basically the thermal conductivity of the solid material times of interfacial area between the zone of fusion and the solid a. We assume the area to be same in both the cases for simplicity of the model here times of d t by d x are temperature gradient in the solid while the heat flows from the zone of fusion into the solid. Okay. So, that is the difference of heat flow into the zone of fusion and outside the zone of fusion and this net heat loss here 
is somewhere recorded as the solid formation okay at or or the you know the heat of formation of the particular solid so if we assume that uh, the rate at which the the solid material gets formulated is dm by dt as you can see in this particular illustration here and l being the latent heat of formation uh, which is in terms of how much mass per kg uh, how much heat is lost in order to formulate the solid so l dm by dt is uh, really nothing but the amount of heat uh, the rate of heat or the, uh, the rate of heat loss okay in terms of formation of the solid bonds A rate of heat loss can be equated in terms of heat going per unit time into the zone of fusion minus heat going away from the zone of fusion per unit time so you can really equate both these equations and that formulates a basis of the zokralki's growth process because uh, you know <coughs> uh, heat flowing in here represented by the first term heat flowing out here represented by the second term and in between whatever is happening in resulting in this formation of the solid phase the ld ldb dm by dt so <coughs> that's really what this zokralki's process is about dt by dx of course is the thermal gradient in the x direction from the either from liquid to the zone uh, solid uh, zone of fusion or from the zone of fusion to to the solid and kl and ks are respectively the thermal conductivities of the liquid state and the solid state of the silicon so <coughs> let us uh, refine this equation a little more by assuming that you have uh, rho as the density of uh, uh, the solid in this particular case and of course a the area of uh, uh, the zone of fusion uh, defined by a constant a is the interfacial area and if we assume that uh, dx length of solid material is formulated uh, because of this heat transfer process so dm really uh, the differential amount of mass is nothing but the density times of the volume adx which is created by virtue of pull out from the zone of fusion into the solid state so if we equate the uh, the the new term obtained for dm into the earlier equation we have l times of rho times of a times of dx by dt which is nothing but the pull rate the pull rate of the seed crystal in terms of uh, uh the rate of displacement of the seed with respect to the crucible so this is the pull rate okay so l times rho times a times a pull rate is nothing but the heat transfer equation which is kx a dt by dx solid minus kl a dt by dx liquid we have just taken the negative of negative and so therefore that's why the equation has changed sign so if uh, we were to assume that our pull rate is maximum for the purpose of high yield production we should have a situation where this negative component should go to zero so therefore typically whatever is coming as heat into the uh, the zone of fusion is really uh, the amount of heat going away from the heat of fusion zone of zone of fusion so that's typically a case in one dimensional heat transfer so this whole equation is a, a maximum on the left side only if this liquid uh, heat transfer from liquid into the zone of fusion is zero or uh, the latent heat really in the, in the in the zone of fusion is the only heat that is diffusing through the solid okay and so therefore this is a one dimensional uh, case where you have the maximum pull rate v max represented by k a by l times of dt by dm or k divided by rho l we are just putting the value of dm here rho a dx times of dt by dx and this dt by dx mind you is in the solid domain as the heat emanates from the zone of fusion into the solid so the maximum pull rate is really proportional to dt by dx or the temperature gradient from the zone of fusion <coughs> on to the solid material 
Okay? And so therefore, uh, one may argue that if you have a very large dt by dx, it would result in maximum yield or maximum pull rate, which is actually not the case. Cut. Ready. So, normally uh, the maximum pull rate is never used and uh, uh, that is because uh, if you give it very less time to formulate, then there is always a, a, a tendency of uh, uh, a lot of point defects particularly uh, in, in the zone of fusion nearer to the melt and therefore, the point defect density would go up very high if the dt by dx increases. So, quick uh, cooling would help to uh, uh, sort of on one hand uh, create a lot of defects into the next formulating zone from the liquid. Okay? Although the defects may not be going into the solid crystal because you have uh, a very less time given for the, the cooling process to take place or the solidification to take place. However, the another aspect of this uh, huge uh, uh, too much thermal gradient is also creation of large thermal stresses within the solid which would rather uh, create dislocations and particularly this is true for larger diameter wafers that the dislocations are uh, very very prominent because of that. So, it is really a, a trade off between uh, the pull rate and the way that the, the defects would go into formulating the crystals or the amount of thermal stresses that the crystals can handle and this together would define how much pull rate is really needed and it is really not a yield decision sometimes, yield based decision sometimes. It is basing itself on the purity of the material particularly when because we are growing single crystalline silicon here, uh, purity of the material in terms of point defects, high uh, the density and also uh, thermal stress created dislocations etcetera. Uh, so, it is a it is a function of a lot of other quality parameters for the wafer apart from the yield. So, that is how the Zokralki's uh, growth process works. Okay. So, uh, the other method which is of uh, some prominence is basically the, the single you know it is called the float zone method which is uh, again another very important method for <coughs> realizing single crystalline silicon. So, in this particular method uh, also called the float zone method, uh, you know it is a uh, it is basically used for extremely high purity silicon growth. Although, uh, downside of this uh, particular process is that you cannot really go above a certain diameter of uh, production of wafer. Like in Zokralkis, you could go up to any extent uh, including 8 inches or you know. Uh, 5 inches bigger size wafers are also possible. In this particular case, um, it is only limited to smaller size wafers and uh, <coughs> the, the process for production really is similar. Uh, you have the concept of a seed crystal in this uh, method as well uh, as, as we had in Zokralkis. However, in this particular case, uh, as you can see, there is a polycrystalline rod uh, which is being pushed into the small orifice here and uh, by means of non-contact mediated heating like an RF mechanism maybe you heat uh, this particular surface of the wafer to almost uh, its melting temperature while pushing uh, the, uh, the polycrystalline rod all the way into the orifice. Okay? And on the other side you lower uh, the seed crystal into the uh, into the uh, uh, this orifice here and uh, the seed crystal is actually used as a template for formation of growth of uh, this polycrystalline material being pushed through the orifice onto the other side. So, from the naked region really in this particular region the seed crystal grows and makes a you know a single crystalline silicon of the type of seed crystal from the polycrystalline melt which you are pushing through this particular orifice. The both the, uh, the rod as well as the, the feeding rod as well as the, the wafers are moving uh, at certain omega velocities and uh, one good advantage here is the uniform heating. So, there are very less thermal stresses and as such 
no thermal stress related dislocations which is otherwise the case in Zokralki's method where there is a huge thermal gradient available because it is essentially a contact mode heating. Here most of the heating means are uh, uh, RF based so that this non-contact mediated and there are no thermal dislocations uh, whatsoever in the particular crystal. So, that is uh, another method of formulation of uh, single crystalline silicon known as float zone method. So, the other material of uh, importance of you know for to the microsystems fabrication is, has been indicated is glass ok. And uh, glass is actually chemically silicon oxide and uh, the content of silicon oxide however, varies uh, from different glasses. For example, soda lime glass would contain about uh, 68 percent of silicon oxide, borosilicate another variety of glass uh, would contain about 81 percent and the highest uh, and the purest form of glass is the quartz really it is a uh, few silica which is actually 100 percent uh, silicon oxide. And uh, basically there are certain other metal oxides along with silicon oxide which are present which would determine the optical transparency or clarity of the glass to um, you know uh, the whole UV vis UV visible region of the spectrum. And so therefore, certain characteristic metal oxides and metal ions would emit their own signatures making glass unclean and absorb at certain frequencies whereas quartz being the uh, purest or the highest uh, form of glass will not absorb any of these wavelengths and would have a clean background as such. So, glass itself has a variety of desirable properties. For example, it has a high mechanical strength, it has high electrical insulation, transparency, high chemical resistance which are all amenable to micro systems. So, therefore, glass sometimes can be used for packaging uh, micro systems typically. And uh, commercially available glasses uh, are now available freely like uh, you know which can be photo pattern. Uh, photo run is one on one such glass can be directly uh, photo pattern on to the substrates and therefore, uh, you know with glass also you can actually use photochemical machining or PCM to uh, uh, you know result in a variety of features and structures at the microscopic lens scale. So, uh, for etching glasses for creating crevices, cavities, features, uh, structures of the micro scale. Uh, within such glasses you normally use buffer HF solution which is actually a solution of HF along with uh, ammonium hydroxide and water. So, that is how uh, that is what glasses are or that is how uh, glasses are important for the microstructure domains. Let us also look uh, a little bit into the, the wafer specifications uh, of silicon wafers and uh, so essentially how they are prepared from the bowl which are uh, being obtained either by Zokralki's method or by the float zone method. So, the bowl is first uh, characterized for resistivity and crystal perfection and uh, these are done by various electrical tests on the bowl. Then the seed and tail are cut off uh, the bowl and they are mechanically trimmed to proper diameter and then of course, uh, uh, then finally, there is a finish trimming operation on to the final wafer diameter since additional etching will still need to be done on those bowls ok. So, for wafers uh, uh, 150 mm or less flats are ground through the entire length of the, of the bowl to denote uh, crystal orientation. So, if you have uh, 100 direction you will have that flat pointing out uh, uh, as a plane towards the plane perpendicular. Uh, 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 to indicate the perpendicular direction as the direction of growth of the particular crystal. So, most of the silicon wafers that you get from industry would have one or two cuts indicative of certain specifications particularly growth related specifications of the silicon wafer. So, <coughs> the, the thing that has to be remembered is the largest flat which is also known as the primary flat in such a circular wafer is oriented always perpendicular to the 100 direction. So, therefore, it is actually uh, the x direction in a right handed coordinate system Cartesian coordinate system and the flat is always perpendicular to the x direction 
and that indicates the direction uh, the other directions of the crystal so in in comparison to that flat you can record what is the 111 direction or 110 direction or 101 direction or any other direction with respect to this x direction so one thing has to be very carefully seen or observed in any silicon wafer which comes from such a foundry you will have to first see what is the largest flat and that is called the primary flat and it is always oriented perpendicular to the 100 direction. Apart from that there are several other specifications of uh, relative importance for example you can actually have cleanliness in terms of particles per centimeter square on the surface area you can have indication of oxygen concentration per centimeter cube that means this per unit volume carbon concentration per unit volume metal contaminants in terms of parts per billion within the crystal lattice and then also you can have per unit area what are the grown in dislocations sometimes these are very well measured using uh, sophisticated non contact mediated optical characterization tools like interferometry etc then you can also have an idea of oxidation induced stacking faults and that can be in the bulk of the wafer so that can be per unit volume and apart from that some normal specifications like diameter and thickness of the wafer or the bow which is nothing but the way that the wafer is warped or bent sometimes and then aspects like flatness and cost so these are all indicated in a wafer box which comes from such a manufacturer uh, or a foundry of silicon so these are some of the specifications uh, which the, normally the manufacturer supplies and then with this specification on and the direction of the flat one can characterize the wafer very well okay so now uh, once we have had a good introduction to silicon and glass let us look at some of the mems fabrication techniques which are really available okay so it is really all about fabrication of micro nano structures inside silicon or glass or some of the materials amenable for mems fabrication that we are concerned with right so it is formation of structures uh, which could be actually used for sensing or actuation purposes at the micro scale so that's <coughs> the purpose of this kind of fabrication right and uh, the idea is that this uh, microstructure so formulated should be able to process some signals it can be electrical signals or it can be non electrical like mechanical signals which can be somehow processed by means of transduction of these features or you know microstructured elements and uh, for production of these uh, you have to use some conventional and some new semiconductor manufacturing techniques uh, for in the in the in the mems region and some of these manufacturing techniques could be something like chemical machining like etching it could be gas based or based on uh, some chemicals it could be deposition where you can deposit a metal film or a resist film on the top of uh, some of these wafers and then of course photolithography where you can use the power of optical signals or light to actually carve and find out different features sizes and structures onto these uh, films and then you can use a variety of other processes like oxidation epitaxy etc which are planned like for example epitaxy would be used for growth of single crystal silicon or oxidation as a matter of fact is a thermal process whereby you can actually entrap oxygen in silicon and at the cost of silicon you can get a layer of silicon oxide or silicon dioxide so these are sort of conventional semiconductor manufacturing processes which have been merged into the mems domain or microsystems fabrication domain apart from that there are deep ri or deep reactive ion etching which is a very new technique in the microsystems domain and then of course thick plating which is also used uh, this is electroplating which is a sort of electrochemical machining operation where you can actually deposit uh, films of certain size and so therefore these are the two other domains which are very commonly used for mems systems or microelectromechanical systems 
apart from that of course, there are these uh, non-traditional processes like USM, AJM, EDM and ECM which have been very recently incorporated for doing activity in fabrication of the micro system or micro uh, manufactured components or devices. So, if you look at all these machining processes in uh, bunch, they can be categorized either as bulk micro machining processes or surface micro machining processes and uh, <coughs> the bulk processes really are about uh, the, uh, the, the subtractive removal of material or subtractive uh, uh, processing of material from uh, a wafer surface. For example, in this uh, particular illustration here or cartoon here, you can see uh, this right here is a section, a cross section of the silicon wafer and you are trying to selectively etch off the material from this wafer. So, there can be for example, a protective layer here which you have etched out and created a small crevice or a cavity. So, another example is this particular etch pit here which is a high aspect ratio structure and this can be obtained by a process called deep reactive ion etching where the power of plasma can be used for driving atoms in a particular direction so that they can knock off the surface atoms here and then based on that high aspect ratio structures can be formulated. <laughs> the third example as illustrated here is again a very interesting example where there is a P double plus uh, layer which has been impregnated here using an implantation or some doping technique and then uh, is an anisotropic etch which actually goes on from the back side here and the material is selective to only silicon and uh, so to P double plus. So, therefore, whenever uh, the, the etchant actually comes and, and uh, hits this area it actually leaves a membrane here, a thin membrane here because it is not able to etch this part. It is selective to P double plus as I already mentioned and the remaining silicon is etched away. So, this is another way of uh, getting what you can say thin film pressure sensors and this is uh, uh, also known as bulk micro machined pressure sensors. Okay. So, why it is bulk is because you are subtractively removing material from the volume of uh, this particular wafer and that is why bulk micro machining is an subtractive process, it is a material removal mechanism. On the other hand, <coughs> surface micro machining is an additive process where you do not really remove the material from the bulk of the wafer, but you keep on adding different layers of materials on to the top of the wafer. Uh, because of which you can create these features and structures. To exemplify some, let us look at this illustration here as can be represented. So, here for example, this is a polysilicon layer uh, which has been put in a manner so that you had a sacrificial layer in this particular region given by the dots. It could be a resist layer and then you have deposited the polysilicon layer on the top of this resist layer and then later on you can remove the resist layer away because polysilicon is a high strength material. So, that you can have a channel on the surface on one side and buried within this polysilicon layer on another side. So, you can remove away this resist later on it just goes off thus resulting in this channel into the uh, plane of the paper uh, or plane of the uh, this transparency slide. So, this is an example of surface micro machining or additive micro machining. Other examples could be deposition of these pillars and posts by using either metals or photoresists where the structures so realized can be of some significance. For example, all the metallic interconnects in, in uh, uh, electronic microelectronic circuitry is actually made using such metal imprints. It is called printed electronics okay? and uh, it is again a additive micro machining process or a surface micro machining process. So, in a nutshell machining can be divided into bulk where you are subtracting from the volume and uh, surface micro machining where you are adding material on the surface to do microstructures and features. So, these are the two broad categories of all machining processes that can be assembled to realize micro systems or micro 
prefabricated architectures. For example, is a slide which has been borrowed from uh, uh, Dr. Mark Madhu's book uh, on microfabrication. So, here it is showing how you can formulate a P double plus membrane and this has already been illustrated. So, you can actually formulate a small cavity here using resist and so this can be used as a H window as, uh, and, and there can be a, uh, an agent which can be selective to P double plus which is actually highly doped uh, positive silicon on the other side and uh, so the material starts etching away in an anisotropic manner thus formulating a 54 degree angle and uh, based on this the uh, it, it just goes up to the selective layer here which is the P double plus layer and stops the etching process thus creating a membrane. The other hand uh, this uh, side is showing how a micro cantilever can be generated by additive micro machining where you have let us say a sacrificial layer over which you have put let us say a, a polysilicon layer like this and then you are removing the sacrificial layer away so that you can have a small cantilever which you have illustrated here uh, in this particular example. So, these are some of the uh, process flow charts or uh, logic diagrams for formulating some of these micro features and micro structures in different uh, illustrations. So, if you look at uh, the bulk micro machining technique, the first uh, uh, process that comes into existence is the etching uh, and particularly wet etching, where there is a chemical uh, which is used for etching off uh, the material. So, it is a subtractive technique again, the etchant is a highly highly corroding or eroding agent which engraves it is uh, uh, wherever it comes in contacts, contact with the wafer and removes uh, the material. So, that you can have these features etcetera imprinted and uh, <coughs> the etching solution is basically uh, 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 very often used in all the microelectronic processing and also in MEMS processing. Uh, so, etching can be divided into two classes, one can be isotropic or homogeneous etching where the, the material removal is uniform as a function of the volume and there can be an isotropic etching where etching can be in a particular direction and uh, the differences are in terms of etch chemistries as I will illustrate in detail in the following slides. So, let us look at isotropic etching and isotropic etching really as I mentioned before the etchant is uh, able to remove or erode away material at uniform or homogeneous rate in all the directions. This for example, is an illustration where there is a etch protective layer which is uh, uh, now <coughs> emboldened by the red highlight the, the red pen here. Okay. And so, this window here of the uh, etch protective layer uh, is able to give an access to the fluid uh, to go into and start etching away the material which is underneath this protective layer. Okay. And in the process, because it is a homogeneous process, the, the material actually goes uh, into the uh, in, into this etch cavity and it starts etching in all directions resulting in this undercut. Okay. So, this layer here which has been formulated, let us say if this distance is x, this is also known as the undercut, because this was not really intended for, it was not planned and uh, because of the homogeneity of the etching, the etching would happen in the lateral as well as the vertical direction which would always result in this kind of an undercut. So, when you design micro systems and the masks for the micro systems, uh, this undercut allowance has to be taken into account for the designing to happen. Uh, if the etching was not homogeneous, for example, uh, as illustrated here, the etching may be uh, a little more directional. So, in this case, for example, you can see the etch rates are more towards the side. So, lateral etching is more and the vertical etching, it would result in different shapes based on what is the directionality of the etching. And so, typically, if you had a very well stirred solution, where whatever is coming out is going away from this etch window, it would result in a homogeneous profile like this. If you do not have a stirred, very well stirred solution, it would rather result in this, because the amount of atoms which are coming out of this material would have a higher concentration here and thus diffusional restrictions would prevent further etchant to move away 
and so the rate in the vertical direction would be reduced in comparison to the horizontal direction. <coughs> Let us look at some of these uh, uh, materials and the agents which are used for the materials and what it is selective to. So, edge selectivity again is a term which is used in reference to uh, the, the fact that you know uh, the uh, there are certain materials which may not be able to get etched away by the etched solution. And in that kind of a case, this, this material which is not uh, affected by the etched solution can be used as a protective layer to stop the etching process very uh, accurately. And therefore, an etch stop layer okay, or an etch selective layer is always preferred as the layer which would prevent the etching from happening any further. So, let us look at this table back again here. So, the material illustrated can be silicon, silicon dioxide, silicon nitride, aluminum, so on so forth. And then there are these etchants which are amenable to removal of these materials. For example, HF or HNO3 or CH3COH or for example, KOH they can remove silicon <coughs> very easily. But as soon as the etchant meets a surface of SiO2, it is selective to SiO2. So, it will not etch SiO2 anymore or it will not etch Si anymore in this particular illustration where NH4 and HF combinations are used. So, therefore, there are certain materials, certain etches which are uh, etching away this material and it is selective to silicon or it is etching away the silicon and it is selective to SiO2. So, the combination of these can be used for a variety of etching architectures that can be realized accordingly. Thank you.